this dress is Welcome back. I'm Celeste and this is a show about my knitting life. I have so much to catch you up on. I'm really excited to get into it. Coco, who is my 11 month old daughter, is napping right now. But if you enjoyed her appearance in the last episode and you need more Coco content, um, make sure to follow me on Instagram at Celeste Full, where I post adorable baby stories almost daily, as well as photos and, of course, knitting content and uh, cooking and reading and all the fun stuff I get up to. I am also Celeste Full on Ravelry. And if you go there, I keep very up-to-date project pages, which will have all of the details about the yarn and the patterns and everything for anything that I show you here. I'm also going to have that linked down below, as well as Instagram. Um, I will probably not remember the names of patterns um, or designers or yarn when I talk through them because I have a very severe case of mommy brain right now. So. Definitely check out Ravelry uh, for all that goodness. So let's see. Um, this is our annual Spooktober episode. You know, I had to get in sometime in October so I could show off the hat um, as I am wont to do. I also have my little raven buddy hanging out here. He's too small to be a raven, I kind of realized. Um, so maybe he's like a crow, but I just feel like Edgar Allan Poe-ish, you know, so I, I want him to be a raven, I guess. Where to begin? When I left off with you, I believe, my whip was this Ar Argyle, Argyle, something like that, tank from Hum Hum Magazine, which I have since finished. You can see it has a tie front detail here. This is made primarily out of linen uh, with a wool silk blend used for the pearl bump stripes, which go in a couple directions on the front. Really, really beautiful top. I still have not taken photos wearing it or even finished, pro finished product photos, I don't think, for the Ravelry. I really need to do that. Um, but I did not actually end up getting that much wear out of this before the weather turned, so I'm quite excited to wear it more next year. I know technically I could wear it like layered under things, you know, throughout the year, but um, I'm really excited to wear it next summer, so hopefully it will still fit well then, because who knows what's going on with my body right now, you know, you have a baby and then you breastfeed and then you gain pandemic weight and it's just... Who knows what's going on so I will be a size next summer and ideally that will still fit me and if it doesn't who knows um, then I also talked about another summer item that I was excited to move on to which is my little ribbed um, loungewear set I did finish the shorts and I actually got a ton of wear out of these before it got colder and these are so lovely. I do have a finished product photo of me wearing them, um, which I will insert so you can see them on. And they are just fantastic. I definitely would make more pairs of these. Um, I enjoyed knitting them. They were fairly mindless, but with enough interest. And the pattern is really well written and easy to follow. Jesse May is so great at that. So, um, Highly recommend. I did start the top that's going to go with the set. I ended up going with the, I think it's called My Secret Crop. It's one of her ripple patterns. Um, but when the weather turned colder, I really wanted to just set it aside so I could dive into some more seasonal knitting. So I'll probably come back to that in the spring. Um, and then next year I will have the full set, which will be fun. Um, yeah, I had trouble deciding which top I wanted to do. First I thought I was gonna do the ripple crop top and 
the Mary Psycho Ripple Browlette, and then the My Secret Crop is the one that I'm doing. And I think, don't quote me on this, but I feel like the Ripple Browlette is maybe sort of skinny straps, and then the My Secret Crop, maybe the straps are thicker, or maybe they crisscross in the back, or something that made me think it was going to give more support. So that was why I ended up choosing that one, because I really did want something sleeveless rather than sleeved, you know, because it's very much a loungewear outfit for those really hot muggy days. Um, but I have a very large chest uh, in the best of times, <laughs> and it is ultra large and heavy right now because I am breastfeeding. And um, assume I still will be next year as well. Um, so I definitely need all the support I can get when it comes to things like that. Um, and what else? Oh, and I knit it out of superwash wool, which I would absolutely recommend for this pattern because um, cotton is just not going to be as stretchy and you really want something stretchy for this. Um, but you know, with like a summer item like this, um, I mean, I personally wouldn't want it to be really warm. So I feel like superwash is just like the perfect compromise for something that's really stretchy, but still really appropriate for summer. Um, a wool silk blend might be another way you could kind of thread that needle. Probably wouldn't be quite as stretchy, but it wouldn't be like, you know, cotton. So getting some silk in there could help it not be quite as warm. In any event, if you go worsted spun instead of woolen spun, that's going to help it to not be as uh, warm also. So those would be my recos for yarn if you are thinking about making those shorts for yourself. And I highly, highly, highly recommend them. Also, the pattern is very easy to fit to your own body. Um, it comes in a variety of sizes. You can make pretty easy modifications, even if those aren't enough. And then it's already so forgiving because it's that three by three rib. So it's really just, you can very easily change the depth of the crotch or the length of the inseam. Um, it has short rows. You can add more short rows. So I really feel like it is an ideal pattern for all sizes and body types. If you are looking for a, uh, a booty short, very, very highly recommend. So I wanted to move on to more seasonal knits, as I mentioned, and I did, um, I was really excited about doing something decorative for the home. I've been spending all my time here because I'm still completely quarantined. I've been um, working from home and taking care of Coco, and I actually haven't had a car since the spring because my car broke down. And I've been putting off buying a new one because since I don't have to go into the office, it's not strictly speaking necessary. Um, so Ryan has a car, you know, so if he's not working, I can use his if I really need to go somewhere. The point is I've been very much in the home all the time and I have gone through <laughs> various different um, stages with that. Uh, I went through a stage where I wanted to get out of this house so badly that I started trying to buy another house. Um, you know, not like another house, but like a different house. Like I was like, let's move. If I move, I can leave my house. So <laughs> there was a period where I was obsessively looking at houses uh, in the same neighborhood because I'm not crazy. I want to stay here, but um, touring houses and, you know, Poor Ryan has been <laughs> very patient with me and um, the way that I have been going slowly crazy this year. Um, so yeah, so there was the, there was a stage of being so desperate to leave the house that uh, I was trying to move because um, that seemed like the most you know reasonable way to get the heck out of this house that I have been stuck in now for almost a year. Um, because there was maternity leave and then right into COVID. Um, after that stage, I <laughs> went into more of a DIY stage where I've been um, 
filling the cracks in the old hardwood floors and um, reading up about, uh, you know, how to repair loose outlets <laughs> and just uh, all kinds of stuff just um, to try to fix the various things about the house that drive me crazy. I'm currently trying to install a different bathroom vanity that's back ordered, but you know, the, all those kind of housing projects. I think a lot of people have been doing stuff like that lately because they have more time and they're stuck in their home. Um, and then uh, I <laughs> got into an organizing stage because I watched a lot, well, I watched all of um, the home edit on Netflix. So I'm currently like, transferring our entire pantry into beautiful clear acrylic bins that are labeled, um, you know, and that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, organizing every drawer in the house. And um, I am also in a bit of a decor <laughs> phase now where I'm um, redoing all of the gallery walls and um, having photos framed by Framebridge and sent and changing <laughs> things up. Um, you know, it's, it's a journey. I think I, I think I'm handling it in a relatively productive way, all things considered. Um, so all that to say, as fall started, I was more excited about decor than um, accessories or clothing per se. And I've had this idea for a long time of making a fall leaf garland to hang over the fireplace, which I will insert photos of um, how it looks hanging over a mantle, which is very pretty. But here you can see it close up. There are three different shapes of leaves. This one, which is almost sort of maple leaf inspired, although it only has three points, which is why I decided to make it red. And then there's and that's sort of, you know, garter stitch, you can see. And these are done in the round in stockinette stitch. So this is actually double layered. And I did these in green and yellow. And they're sort of inspired by the magnolia tree that we have out front, which has green and yellow leaves on it because its leaves change really slowly. So, um, and they're about this shape. And then these are oak leaves. So I made them this sort of firmly brown color as oak leaves turn. And they're garter with this beautiful decrease line up the front. These are three different patterns for leaves, um, which I mixed together. I actually changed up the pattern for this one. I changed the, um, how many increases I did because the first one I made was way too large. So um, I kind of fiddled around with that. And then I, uh, made an eye cord and sewed them onto it. So it's kind of a mismatch of um, patterns that are available and my own ideas. I looped over the eye cord on both sides so that you can easily hang it. I have these like 3M hooks that are um, sort of hidden under the mantle, which we've used for stockings in the past. And it's perfect for hanging a garland. So I really like the idea of making more of these for different um, times of year, you know, like a spring one or um, a Christmas one, that kind of thing. But I've always, always wanted this fall leaf one. And it really, I mean, it's small, but it's an involved project. I'm sure you can tell and, and you would think like, there's a lot of eye cord to do. There's a lot of little individual things to do. And it took a lot of planning to get the spacing right and decide on the colors and make sure the leaves were, you know, good sizes that went with each other. The oak leaves come in two different sizes. There's a small and a larger one. Um, so I put a lot of care and, and thought into it and I really enjoyed that process and making it come to life. Um, I did all of it with Retrosaria Mondime, which is one of my absolute favorite yarns. It's a beautiful um, Portuguese fingering weight, non-superwash wool. Uh, it's lovely and toothy. And I held it double to get like a DK weight. 
so that, you know, the, these knit up more reasonably quickly. Um, but yeah, huge fan of how this turned out. I think the yarn was perfect for it. It doesn't have any sheen to it, um, you know, or any fuzz to it. So they really look, they have that nice sort of matte look and, and there's plenty of definition in the shape of the leaves. And they just very much have the look that I, I pictured in my mind. And my fireplace is um, painted white. So this sort of undyed color nicely almost kind of disappears into the, the mantle um, when they're hanging. So that's why I went with that as the neutral. And um, yeah, I just absolutely love, love, love how it turned out. I'm like, it's rare, I think, that there's something that you kind of have in your mind and then you go and you make it and it, and it turns out pretty much exactly how you envisioned it. Um, and especially, you know, right now with all of the brain fuzziness that I have had, which I feel like I've been talking about that since <laughs> like for years because there was grad school brain and then there was pregnancy brain and now there's mom brain. So you guys probably think that I'm just a spacey person who has a new thing to blame it on every year. But the truth is that I did not used to be. I genuinely did not used to be. And I probably am permanently now. Like, yeah, it's probably all over for me. But um, the fact is that with the cognitive challenges that I am currently facing, not to mention the kind of every project you do must be done in fits and starts when you have a baby and you're constantly interrupted. Um, because of all of that, doing a project that involves a certain amount of making decisions and plans yourself versus just following a pattern to the T, um, it's not always a good idea. Like it can be challenging and frustrating and not work out well. And um, in this case, it just, I don't know, the stars aligned and it just came together. So that was a very, very happy making project. And then the next thing I did is also decor-ish in that like he lives on the mantle right now and um is a lovely little piece of decor but it's more a toy for Coco uh which is this little guy oh my god I love him so much um this is Patch and Patch that was a cute little pumpkin head this I did follow a pattern to the T Feel like it's maybe Susan B. Anderson, but please don't quote me on that. It will be on Ravelry. Um, and this I did with Quince and Co. yarn and these lovely shades. I feel like the colors that they provided really put this pattern, make this project like over the top perfect because it's so natural looking with these like green leaves. And then this is almost a grayish dark green color of the body. And then the lovely sort of naturally pumpkin-y orange. I just absolutely love this guy. And it's got so much character, the way the legs are attached. And this comes in the pattern. There are pearl bumps to show you where to attach the legs. But the way that they're offset like this, I think just gives it so much character, especially like when you have it sitting on the edge of something like resting with the little legs dangling over. I put rice in the bottom before I added stuffing, which uh, it wasn't in the pattern, but that was just my idea. And uh, it does help it to sort of sit and balance a little bit. You still usually need to prop him up against something just because with such a big head, it's a little top heavy. Um, but it does help. The rice does help, I think. And um, yeah, and I, and, and I think rice is relatively safe if it were to come out. Um, those pieces are so small, I don't think they're a choking hazard. So uh, that's why I chose rice instead of like beans or something. But um, yeah, the face is a little wonky. It's not perfectly symmetrical. I did do the smile twice. Um, and then I just decided to live with it because I do think it gives it character to not be perfect. Um, I don't know. Ideally, I think the smile would be a little bit better, but what are you going to do? What are you going to do? 
So Coco loves this guy. It's really, the arms and legs are really easy for her to grab and carry around. Um, I went to the pumpkin patch with us over the weekend. We finally made it to a beautiful pumpkin patch. Um, and has been sitting in this pile of pumpkins that I have sitting next to me in front of the fireplace. I'll insert a picture of that as well. Um, just hanging out with the pumpkins and just making me so happy every time I see it. So I love, love, love October. I must say the coming of fall this year has been bittersweet in a way it never has before because of course, I don't know about you, but for me, I've only seen my mother this year um, outdoors because she's high risk and we can't include her in our family bubble because Ryan works at a hospital and so it would just be too risky to um, have close contact with her even if we agreed that we wouldn't do it with anyone else, you know? So I still have only seen her outdoors and haven't hugged her and she hasn't held Coco since she was three months old and everything. Um, and of course, all of that is about to become and is already becoming much more difficult because it is very cold outside. It's in the forties most of the time. And, you know, we're planning Coco's first birthday, which is Thanksgiving weekend. Um, and right now the plan is to have it at a local park and just have everyone dress warm. But of course I'm worried that people aren't even gonna wanna come because it just makes everything so much more difficult. And you have to worry about how cold it is and you know, what is the winter gonna be like? And obviously like we're already, the numbers are already going up with new infection rates because of the weather turning colder. and everyone being indoors more. I mean, that's what flu season is, right? Like that's why people get sick in the winter is because we spend more time indoors. So, um, I always get excited about October and about fall and about winter. I love the cool seasons, but it's definitely been bittersweet this year. So, um, just finding those little ways to celebrate it and embrace it, you know, with the knitting is, is quite helpful. Um, yeah, so that brings me to my whip, and then I actually have some very exciting sewing that I want to share. So, the whip is a sweater I'm making for Coco to wear over her birthday dress, because as I said, the plan is an outdoor party right now. So, I made her this beautiful party dress, which I will show you in the next segment. And the plan is for her to wear it with a sweater and tights and, you know, probably a hat and mittens. I have to figure out that whole thing. She doesn't have any mittens right now. And it became very clear when we went to the pumpkin patch that she needs, because her little hands got quite cold. She has the like mini cell boos I made for her as an infant, but they don't even have a thumb. And they're too small at this point for her big old hands. Um, she needs something she can grab. So holler at me if you know a good mitten pattern for very small hands, like very small little, you know, she's one. And she wears like size six months clothes still. So um yeah. Needs to needs to have thumb gussets, but little for a little guy. Let me know. Okay, so. She has this lovely party dress that I made for her and it needs a sweater. So I found this pattern, the party dress, and you'll see it, it has like almost an on pure sort of waistline and it, and then it poofs way out. It's like this beautiful gathered skirt. And so I didn't want something that was going to disrupt those lines. I wanted something that would be cropped. And I found this lovely sweater that actually has a single button here and then it, um, the shaping goes out like this to expose the bust line of the dress and then it curves around in the back and gives you a beautiful little ruffle right at the natural waist which is going to sit right at the waist of the back of the dress because the dress is higher in the front than in the back it'll sit right at the back of the dress and just basically it's like the sweater and the dress were made to go together like the shape is perfect so i'm so thrilled i'm hoping it's going to be warm enough. It is 
worsted weight and I'm making it with Brooklyn Tweed Shelter which is a 100% non-superwash woolen sponge so it's a very warm um, wool and I am making it out of this postcard which is looking really gray on camera it's actually more of a lavender um, and the only alteration I'm doing is I'm making long sleeves and um, yeah I'm on to I'm on the first sleeve right, right now so I'll kind of show you how this is working here's the front so it's gonna have this button here and it's kind of curling in right now but you can kind of see the shape it's making here's the raglan increase and then here's the edge and then you can see this cute little seed stitch ruffle that's going all around the back so just need to get those sleeves finished up I have been just knitting on it here and there I've been um, more focused on sewing in my time that I actually have because I made her the dress and I made a wearable muslin before I made the dress and the dress was pretty involved so um, and then that awakened my love of sewing in a way where I've now started working on projects for myself um, which I'll talk a little bit about um, but yeah so this has just been going in fits and starts but um, now that we're coming up on being one month out from the, the party, I want to go ahead and get it finished and feel like I have the whole outfit figured out, figure out the mittens and um, all of that so that I can move on to decor and menu and, you know, all that kind of thing. It's all very exciting. She's going to have a mushroom themed party. I'm going to make a banner that says wild one, which I think is like so freaking cute. And then I'm going to have our little letter board say something like um, one year old and still so mushroom to grow. So all about the puns uh, and the dress has a mushroom print. Um, and then I'm thinking maybe like a sort of Yule log style, like woodland inspired log shaped cake with Mars pan mushrooms on it or something along those lines. Um, and then maybe some other mushroom inspired small bites. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna grab the dress. It is actually, I forgot to get it out of her room. And right now she's napping. So I need to creep in and not wake her up. Success. First, the wearable muslin. This is the Bristol dress by Little Lizard King. Somehow I actually remember that. Um, so this is the wearable muslin and there are instructions for doing this as a full length dress or as a sort of top, like a tunic. I was doing a double layer skirt and I read the instructions where it said skirt, top skirt as like the top layer skirt or whatever. So on the muslin, I cut the length that is for the top pattern, the tunic pattern, rather than the full length, which doesn't matter because, you know, it's muslin. Um, but now I would like to use this fabric to make her like some little bloomers so she has a matching set. But I think I'm gonna wait and see if it actually still fits her in the spring um, and then make the bloomers so that I don't waste my time on a little outfit that she does not wear. But, so, here's the wearable muslin. This is just some like, I don't know, some kind of rayon or tinsel or something that I had in my stash, very drapey. It's definitely got a different texture than the fabric the final one is out of, so they, they look a lot different, but it was perfect for fitting. And I really wanted to make a muslin, not just because this is an important dress, and the fabric I bought is a little expensive because I got it from Spoonflower, so it's like custom. Um, but also because this wonderful pattern comes in a range of sizes, 12 months all the way to 14 years, which is awesome because I'm going to make her more of these. Um, but even though this is for her first birthday, she is a full inch 
smaller um, in her chest measurement than the 12 month size. So I knew that I was going to hack all the seam allowances and I wanted to make sure that that was gonna fit her. Um, so I did the muslin and it also was good because one thing I realized when I made it is that I should not have hacked the seam allowance for the um, button placket. Anyway, the middle, the back, whatever, where the buttons are. That should have stayed the same because on the muslin, I actually don't have as much overlap here as I'm supposed to. And it doesn't, it looks fine. It's whatever. But that was something I learned and applied to the real dress. Also, I cut the wrong length skirt. So good thing I had the muslin. And then I also tried out an idea for the sleeves. So the sleeves in the pattern have a sort of slit with the placket and little ties, which is cute enough. I wasn't in love with how it looked and I didn't think it was the most practical thing for this dress, given that she'll be wearing a sweater over top of it because then you'll have all this bulk of these ties in the sleeve of the sweater. So I wanted to try something else. So for the muslin, I tried just elasticating. And this is cute enough, but actually because it's so tiny, it was very hard to sew something with such a small circumference um, to like hem it. So where I put in the elastic is quite um, uneven, kind of sloppy. So I just don't like the way that that looks. So I did not do that on the real pattern. So multiple things on this that made it good that I was using a muslin. The buttonholes also don't look too closely at them. They're really sloppy, um, but it's, you know, it's wearable enough. She will probably wear it once, if at all, before she outgrows it. And the important thing is, then I moved on to the real dress, which is perfect. This is why we make muslins. I got to make all my mistakes on that dress, which meant I did not have to stress them at all. And this dress is exactly how I pictured in my head and lovely. So what I ended up doing for the sleeves was shortening them to short sleeve. And I did a hem with fusible tape that you just iron down. So I did not have to mess with that tiny little circumference, which ruled. I also used it for the actual hem. You can see no stitching involved. So it's quite pretty and professional looking with no top stitching. And then the other kind of like hack or just like the unusual way I chose to do this, this dress has an option for a double layer skirt and an option for a ruffle on the bottom of the skirt. What I choose to, chose to do was to do a double layer that have the underneath be tulle and then give a ruffle to the tool to give it this lovely petticoat quality, which adds more volume, more floof, more sort of party energy. And it also sticks out a little bit longer than the actual skirt. So you have that pop of color and that hint of festive tool under a bear. Um, this is how the button placket is supposed to look when you don't screw up like I did on the <laughs> muslin. And these set in sleeves, I'm telling you, I've never been so proud of myself. Look at this, look how gorgeous. There's this little bit of gathering at the top, a little bit of like blousing. I mean, inside, open it up. You can see here the bodice. Let me just take this out. Here we go. And unbutton for you. The bodice is fully lined. I just used the same fabric. And then you can see here the where the skirt attaches. I did like a um, zigzag stitch to finish. 
And something I really like as well is this detail where the where I attached the ruffle to the tool, I made sure to crop the excess really closely so that you don't have bulky extra fabric there. And I think that gives it a really professional look as well. So I definitely had to like take my time with this. I did it in various different sittings, not to mention the separate sittings for the wearable muslin itself. Um, and I really wanted to not rush. I feel like an issue I've had in the past with sewing is I get sloppy because I rush and I rush because I don't have a dedicated sewing space. So I feel like, oh, I've gone and I've gotten down my sewing machine from the attic and I cleared off the table to cut the pattern or whatever, and ironing and gotten the iron down and blah, blah, blah. And it's such a production that if I don't get the entire thing or a huge amount of the thing done in that one sitting, um, it just feels like too much. So knowing that I'm super busy right now and I have a baby and I'm gonna have to do it in fits and starts, I just made peace with the fact that my sewing machine is gonna be sitting on my dining room table for weeks. And that helped a lot. <laughs> Not having to get it down and clean it up and get it down and clean it up means that I can actually work and I actually do work and I, you know, do work with a level of precision and patience that I ordinarily wouldn't. Um, and it's just been great and like, I feel like I want to sew more and I want to keep it out more. And, you know, it's imperfect that I don't have space for like a dedicated sewing space, but I'm figuring out a way to store it in a kind of closet off the dining room rather than up in the attic. And ideally, um, I think maybe the sewing machine itself is even going to stay on the table unless we're having guests over because we have an enormous like dining room table anyway and my husband's laptop is on it half the time so half the time all the time um so like who am I trying to you know appease with this rule of like my sewing machine can't be on the dining table all the time like is it perfect no like do I wish I had a sewing room sure I do but when I don't have my sewing machine out, I don't sew. I just don't sew for years. Just years go by where I don't sew because it's in the attic. You know what I mean? It, like, so in a way, I think the fact that I had to resign myself to just like having to work around the busyness of my life right now has made me realize that I need a better system and this system, imperfect as it is, is probably better. It's probably better to have a sewing machine on your dining room table than to never sew, right? So that's good. It's good for me to kind of get over my obsession with perfectionism a lot of times where it's like not helping me. Anyway, so this dress freaking rules. Um, I tried it on her and it does fit her. And I have a couple photos I'll insert just so that you can see what it looks like on her. Although they're not great photos. It's, they're just like photos I snapped for my Instagram stories while, I, while she was trying it on. We will have better photos in the future. Um, but yeah, I want you to see what it looks like on her. So there it is. And this, as I said, really just ignited um, a newfound interest in sewing. And right now I am... Um, struggling a lot with my size and shape and you know I've always yo-yoed because I have a history of disordered eating and I've been a slave to the diet culture that we live with in our society especially in America um especially being a young woman who is, you know, interested in fashion and grew up dancing and acting and all of the things that made me vulnerable to it. Um, so for a long time, I have had this sort of like boxes in the attic of clothes that don't fit anymore and cleaning out the closet. And it's like, oh, 
all these clothes are too small. Oh, all these clothes are too large now. All these clothes are too small now. And that's extra frustrating when you put time and care into making them yourself, right? And I think that's part of what has kept me from sewing more in the past. And I think it's part of what has made me enjoy, you know, sweater knitting more because there's more leeway there. Like this sweater that I'm wearing now, I made last year and it fit me um, before I was pregnant. It fit me when I was nine months pregnant and it fits me now that I am not pregnant, but I'm heavier than I was pre-pregnancy, right? It has a lot more leeway for that. All that to say, currently, there are very few hard pants in my closet that fit. Um, I had a baby last November. I lost almost all of my pregnancy weight um, in the following three months. And then I gained all of it back during COVID um, for any number of reasons, probably a lot to do with you know, high progest progesterone, what's, what's it called? Anyway, that hormone, the stress hormone and, you know, breastfeeding and being pregnant and giving birth and your body isn't meant to lose a whole lot of weight really quickly. And then it tries to find the new normal. And then I'm more sedentary now because I'm not leaving my house and stressed out and, you know, whatever. Like, I don't even know. Um, <laughs> but the point is that I am struggling with my body image and I'm also struggling with the fact that although it's fine to wear sweatpants every day right now because I'm at home, um, it kind of sucks and I kind of like, I love clothes and I have so many clothes in my wardrobe that I love that don't fit me and it's really frustrating. Um, so another thing that I'm doing is I am finally working with a counselor um, specifically on intuitive eating, um, eating disorder recovery and body image. I guess I'm just going all out there and talking to you guys <laughs> about where I'm at. Okay, it's important. I think it's important to be open about these things. Doesn't mean it's not a little scary. Um, so I'm seeing a counselor virtually um, every week and working on, um, trying to become free from food obsession and from, you know, body dysmorphia. Um, and one thing that I really working on is self care. Um, for me personally, it's, something that I'm really not good at. I do a lot of pushing through and, you know, saving self-care for like the end of the day and, um, not pausing in between things and not, you know, I do a lot of trying to withhold things from myself as like, um, motivation. So it'll be like, oh, well you can't, you know, make that sweater for yourself that you want to make until you make these things that, you know, you committed to make because you bought the yarn for them already or whatever, like that kind of thing, right? Like constantly making up rules that no one else cares about. No one is forcing me to do, but I'm like punishing myself in a way, um, and not taking care of myself. And so something that occurred to me was what an act of self-love and self-care it would be to really take time to make clothing for myself that fits me now in this body without any worries as to whether or not it'll fit me in the future. I could get bigger, I could get smaller, and I'm not even going to think about it because I deserve beautiful clothing that fits me well right now. I deserve clothing that is perfectly tailored to my exact size and shape in this moment. And in the same way that I, I sat and I, you know, with love and care and attention, created this beautiful dress that is perfectly 
tailored to my beautiful daughter who I love, I want to sit and put that kind of love into something for myself. Um, and I need to, and I think it would be really a good practice for me right now um, with the uh, work that I'm doing currently with my counselor. Um, and you know, bonus, I get cute clothes out of it. So, so I have purchased some patterns. I have um, gone and printed them and taped them together and cut them out and all of this in various different little sittings here and there, just taking the time, trying to have the patience little bit by little bit by little bit. Still haven't even cut fabric, but I'm almost there. I have washed the fabric. <laughs> I have a stack here of fabric that I purchased online that came, that has been washed and needs to be pressed and cut. Um, these are going to be some dresses. No, these are going to be some dresses. This is going to be some pants. This is just some muslin that um, I'm probably going to use to make a wearable muslin for a blouse that I'm going to make out of some other fabric that's coming, some linen that's coming. Um, and here's the really cool thing. The dress I'm making, I think it's called the Hinterland dress. It's by So Liberated, I think. Um, and I made a full bust adjust adjustment on my pattern for the first time ever. I had no idea what a full bust adjustment involved at all. I looked it up. I traced it out with my Swedish tracing paper. And you can see this going up to this point, all the way down here and over here, as well as this extra bit in the dark is all excess that I have inserted into what the pattern, the shape that the pattern already had. And I have, you know, we'll see how well it works out. I don't know yet, but <laughs> I have to tell you, it did feel like an almost radical act of self-care and self-love to methodically take these measurements of my own body and resist, you know, the shame of like what those numbers are and what that means and blah, blah, blah. And trace them out and, and hack a pattern to fit my body instead of trying to carve my body to fit some standard, right? It's really powerful. It's actually really It's a really beautiful practice, I think, to take time to very slowly craft something that is customized to you. I have never done anything like this before. And it's really exciting. And I get to learn new things and challenge myself. And it's funny because I feel like I've had a hang up for a while about sewing where I think because I'm not already an expert at it, it's like, I don't know. For a long time, I didn't sew that much because it was time that would be, that I could be knitting. Right now, it's just feeding something in me that needs to be fed. And it's very exciting. And it means that I get to really challenge myself and learn new things in a way that I haven't in a while because um, I'm, I'm pretty advanced at knitting and there's not you know, a lot of the projects that I do, they involve small things that I haven't done before that I kind of catch on to easily. Or sometimes they're, you know, every so often one of them will be very challenging. But this is like a whole new ball game for me. I mean, I'm like, <sighs> I'm just diving in and having to be like, having to have that, 
sort of resourceful muscle engaged of just knowing that I don't know how to do it, but I'm just going to get to the next step and I'm going to figure that out and then get to the next step and figure that out, which is how I felt as a newbie knitter. And it was wonderful. And because I did that, it gives me confidence that I can do it with another craft, right? And I haven't felt that way in a while and it's very exciting. Um, so hopefully this dress turns out, I mean, <laughs> Maybe it won't, who knows? But the process has been lovely so far, really lovely. Um, yes, it's very exciting. And I also am planning an even bigger project, which is a pair of Nolan pants from Seam Work. Wow, I'm crushing it with remembering these things right now. Um, <laughs> The Nolan pants are like a high-waisted, um, relaxed fit sort of jean, like they have the um, patch pockets on the back, and uh, I'm going to make them with this brown denim. I'm going to make proper muslins and do, you know, adjustments for, you know, crotch length and, you know, full rear and, you know, whatever it turns out that I need based on the... the um, the muslin and it's going to be a whole thing it's going to be a whole thing who knows maybe months um but that's what i do when i knit a sweater right so it's like it's exciting because then i can have a beautiful pair of hard pants that fit my body and it's gonna roll i'm really really excited about that so that's on the horizon um yeah Very cool stuff. So thank you so much for tuning in to chat with me this um, week, month, season, however long it's been uh, since I did this. And I really hope that you're well. I hope that you are enjoying the change in the seasons, even with the, the scariness that it may bring. I hope that you and your family and your friends are well and healthy and safe and um, and that you're knitting and you're sewing and whatever it is that you are doing is bringing you peace and happiness and giving you something to put loving energy into at a time when there's so much that is outside of our control. Um, we are, many of us, you know, home right now and, um, and our worlds are a lot smaller right now. And um, I hope that your craft is making your world a little bit bigger for you. Take care and I will see you sometime soon.